you should do this and you shouldn't do that. So let's see uh, what we have and then we will try to figure it out. Uh, so I have to disclose that I have nothing to disclose in this uh, talk. Uh, the objective is very simple. The main, my target of today lecture is the physiologic changes and the physiology, okay? If you understand that part, then the fluid and electrolyte is very easy uh, for you to understand. Um, and then, of course, uh, we will discuss some recommendations, the recent recommendations. So FEN management in units. So before going that, what is essentials for life at that age group? There are three things, food, fluid and electrolyte, and the shelter. Shelter in that age group, people's party but this is the real fact, okay? The control of environment and the temperature control, this is the most important part. And the many times we are, you know, uh, uh, what you called uh, neglecting it uh, in our daily practice. So the essential of the neonatal care, uh, whatever the arrangement you want. Okay, so for our country, I think infection management is the first, then control of environment, then FEN, and then respiratory CVS and CNS. So these are the four major things we should know about uh, when we are taking care of any neonate of any uh, gestational age. Some terminologies, people are always mix these two things, osmolarity and osmolality. Uh, I think you all know the difference, okay? I have to tell you because uh, many times these terminologies are, you know, um, the, the misunderstood and they can uh, use uh, um, either of the, uh, those in, in many places, okay? So osmolarity is the refer the number of the solute particles per one liter. And the osmolality is in one kilogram. So for our part, we always doing according to the weight, according to the mass. Where we use the volume, we say osmolarity. Where we use the mass is the osmolality. So these are the difference. This is from the pda.com and this is the, everybody that this is the difference in the definition. Calculated the volume and this is the mass of the solution. The millimole, uh, the mole per liter is the osmolarity and the osmole per liter is the unit for osmolality. Depend on the temperature and pressure. So that's a difference, a major, major difference. We know that if you put, a, uh, let's say you have a one liter of uh, water and you put one gram or uh, five gram of salt in it, if the temperature is the boiling temperature, the osmolarity is changed. If the temperature is the freezing, the osmolarity is changed. But the osmolality does not depend on temperature and pressure. So we, most of our part of our human body, we have the temperature, we have the pressures, but our body is maintaining this. So we will use osmolality uh, uh, you know, in the in this talk or all the time instead of osmolarity because it it's not changed with the temperature and pressure. So our body osmolality is maintained. It is not changed when we have a fever or only it changed the osmolality if we have dehydrated the osmolality increase. If we are uh, you know taking too much water, then osmolality is decreased. So why it is important, we already discussed about that. Is a can, if we calculate the diff, uh, wrongly, I must not use the word wrongly, or if we miscalculate, then it can cause the serious morbidity for our newborns. Come to the physiological facts, which is very important to understand. Body composition and the surface area. As you all know that the the smaller the body composition, the smaller the body, the larger the surface area. So 
So the new nates are born with an excess of total body water, excess cellular fluid has to be removed. Therefore, so the surface area of the newborn is relatively large and the insensible water will be the greatest. So if you see the percentage of human body, fetus is about 85% is uh, water. Baby at birth, like full-term baby, 75%. When you are normal adult, is 60%. And when you are adult people, it is about 50%. So this is the slide from the physiology book by the Hansen published in 1961. Uh, I, you know, I was not even born at that time, but uh, this is so important to understand this, uh, that what is happening from the fetal life to the newborn life, that the total body water is start decreasing. Initially, the extracellular fluid is high, which is the fetus, fetal life and ICF, intercellular fluid, is less. But when you born, uh, when uh, the baby born, it increase and the ECF is decrease. So the water moves from the maternal to the fetal circulation across the plata, placenta. It is about 20 ml per kg per day. And total water is partitioned between the fetus, placenta, and amniotic fluid is about 350 ml is intravascular at term, which is going to be increased as soon as the baby born. So there is a transition period for that. So we have to understand that there is a transition period for that. This is the slide showing you that how the components, uh, different components are changing in different gestational age by weeks. Okay, uh, This is uh, 24 weeks to 40 weeks total body water. As I said, 85%, 86% is uh, decreased to 78% and at one to four week of life, it is about 74-75%. Similar happened to extracellular, happened to sodium, potassium, and the chloride. So this is very important slide. So uh, you know that uh, everything is decreasing in different uh, gestational age. The increase the gestational age, you are decreasing the components. Another important thing, sensible versus insensible water loss. Sensible water loss is easy to measure. Urine, stool, NG, if it is something coming out or the OG, if, the, if you take the CSF, if you are doing the tap for hydrocephalus, so you know the uh, sensible water loss. But the problem is the insensible water loss. Okay, it is not readily measured. So the evaporation from the skin, yeah, approximately 66%, I will give you the figure, approximately in the respiratory tract is about 33%. And the insensible water loss is uh, lower uh, in the lower gestational age is mainly because of the immature skin. So these are the insensible water loss, uh, uh, cc per kg per 24 hours. And these are the very premature babies and these are the bigger babies. So as you can see that with the passage of time, less than 1, 3, 7, 14, 21, 28 days, what is the about approximately insensible water loss? And it is measured at 50% relative humidity. We will come back with uh, that what humidity we should put. How you calculate the insensible water loss? intake minus urine output minus weight loss. So whatever the thing, you can calculate it. The uh, FEN uh, management is all is assessment and calculation, assessment and calculation. So all these formulas you should know or have a, a handout. I will send this uh, in the academic neonatology as a PDF and you can have it and then you can apply. So this is the old chart, the weight gain chart, and this is the new one, which we are uh, following now, postnatal chart. It's a little bit more flat as compared to that because they realize that it is not possible that the postnatal age, it, it gained weight like that. So it's about 20 to 25 grams per kg per day is enough to catch up growth uh, and to maintain the um, AGA status appropriate for gestational age status. So keep this thing in the mind, if the baby is very small, the composition is, uh, is water, uh, the extracellular fluid is the highest, is intracellular fluid is less, and the non-water is very, very less. 
when you come to the term, the non-water increase, the extracellular cellular decrease, and ICW increase. And one year of age is uh, the uh, ICW increase, ECW decrease, and the non-water also increase. So if you have this pa these parameters in your mind, this is very easy for you people to calculate uh, the thing. Physiological fact number two, renal mat immaturity. We all know that the growth is the last trimester. Uh, and if they miss the last trimester, then it is very uh, uh, premature babies or the premature babies, the ren renal function is not fully mature. So what happened at the renal function? So the urine volume of approximately like, uh, let's say 45 ml per kg per day or two ml per kg per hour allows the excretion of normal solute load, typically in dilute urine, which is not, happening in those premature babies or even in the 37, uh, 36 weeks babies. So the proportion of the cardiac output is also important uh, initially. So the first week after the birth, it is about 2% uh, going to the uh, kidneys, 8.8. .8. At five weeks, 9.6. At one year, then in adult is about 16% of car uh, the cardiac output is going. So initially, in the age, what we are discussing now, it is, uh, sorry about that, I will take the pointer, okay. So initially, it is very low cardiac output is going to the kidneys, so we have to be very careful. That's why, you know, whenever we start these antibiotic left and right gentamicin, we have to be very careful on that. Renal function are reduced. Uh, of course, and uh, it's smaller the baby, the, uh, the lesser the renal function, decreased DFR, decreased tubular absorption, and decreased capacity to concentrate or dilute the urine. So what is the GFR? The glomerular filtration rate at 25 to 28 weeks is 11 plus minus 5.4, which is very, very low. If, if an adult have this GFR, he has to be on dialysis or kidney transplant. 29 is 15.3 and uh, the term is 40.6 plus minus 14.8. For an adult person, it has to be 60 and above. Uh, ml per minute per uh, 1.73. So if uh, you calculate the GFR of someone who has uh, less than that 50, 40, uh, he has to check uh, his uh, uh, nephrologist. Oh, sorry about that. I'm going backwards. Okay. The effects of antenatal glucocorticoids. The antenatal glucocorticoids is the... Um, key for everything. So not only promote the lungs, but also help in maturation of the skin and the kidneys and lower the insensible water loss. So that's why we all recommend up to 34, 35 weeks uh, if the baby um, indicated that delivered early or prematurely, uh, it is better to give antenatal uh, steroid to the mother. This is the pattern, how the GFR in the preterm infant uh, increased by day 7 and day 28 is ml per minute per 1.73. The creatinine clearance is the similar way. The term is high uh, as compared to the uh, smaller babies and the in, in between it is in between. So, I mean, this is, I'm just telling you to Keep in your, the consideration because I want to make a point in, when we come to the uh, management. So these are the normal creatinine value in milligram per deciliters are in the uh, brackets. Uh, so whatever the unit you are used. Uh, this slide uh, shared with me by Dr. Richard Poland. And in 2017, he came here also. Uh, so we were discussing something else. So at that time, this data is not presented. So this is uh, according to him that this is the very valid data, the validated data. And these are approximately uh, the creatinine uh, values in milligram, uh, uh, creatinine values, as you can see here. So if you know that, like say 30, 30 weeks, if you know at day, day zero, okay, it's your creatinine level is 1.22, 
don't worry about that, that, oh my God, something happened to the kidney. Okay, just wait and see the day six to eight, day 10 to 15 and day 30 to 35. So we have to be give a time for a transition period to uh, get over and then uh, we will work on it. So this is 38 to 42 weeks. How you calculate the creatinine uh, clearance for the male is 140 minus H time weight in kilogram divided by serum creatinine times 72. And for female, just multiply that value by 0.85. The concentration of urine is also a problem. So the newborn infant have limited capacity to concentrate the urine. As you can see, the urine is very much diluted in preterm. It's 600 milliasmol per kg only, and the adult is uh, almost uh, 1400 milliasmol per kg. So the uh, concentration of the urine is very, very low. On contrary, the dilution, if you give too much fluid, the baby or the full-term, even the full-term newborn cannot dilute the uh, urine. So that's why you can get edema or puffiness and all those things. So the, uh, the term newborn maybe can go up to 50 milliosmol of the adult value. The kidney or preterm can only about the 70 milliosmol per kg. So we have to understand all these concept. Now come to the sodium. Preterm infant do not conserve sodium effectively. So this is the thing which we have to know that the fraction excretion of the sodium in preterm infant is due to the wasting of the sodium. So it is not until 32 week gestation that we have a positive sodium balance. And the increase in sodium reabsorption is uh, mainly in the proximal convoluted tubule then in the uh, thin uh, ascending limb of a loop of Henley, and then 5% only in the distal convoluted. Uh, it depends uh, it, uh, which one. So, but the main thing is that we have to understand that is 75% in the proximal convoluted tubule. And these are the maturation of the kidney in regards of fractional excretion of the sodium. The, uh, the lower the gestational age, the higher the uh, fraction excretion in percentage as compared to the uh, more mature babies. So this is the summary of all what I just said. And if you see all this thing, then you can know how to maintain the fluid balance in a baby. So the, the timing is the postnatal. Uh, the pre-diuretic phase is zero to two. The diuretic phase is one to five. And the post-diuretic phase is two to five days. The urine output is less than two ml per kg per hour is fine. In diuretic phase, three ml. And then post-diuretic phase, it has to be proportional to your intake, okay? Whatever you are giving to the baby. Fluid balance is negative. Then in diuretic phase is more negative and positive for growth. So you have to understand that these are the phases which the baby is going from in utero life to the ex utero life, similar with the GFR, sodium, <coughs> sorry, sodium potassium balance and sodium and potassium excretion. This is a very important graph to understand all the physiology. Last thing in the physiology is the insensible water loss, as we discussed. I told you the formula how to calculate. This is the graph uh, presented um, in, um, in 1998 uh, in general of uh, dermatology that the insensible water loss uh, in ml per kg per day in the uh, postnatal age uh, in the 25 weeker. Look at this is too much. It's 200 ml as compared to the full-term baby, which is almost the same in about 28 days of life. So this easy question, name three things that increase the insensible loss and three things that decrease. So increase the premature skin, respiratory distress, um, any opening, surgery, radiant warmers, activity, non-humidified oxygen, third spacing, phototherapy, I will talk about it in one slide, decrease uh, insensible, of course, mature skin, high relative humidity, heat shield, blankets, clothes, antenatal steroids. So these are the things uh, you know, whatever it's available to you, so you can calculate accordingly. Okay, this is just this case. So the humidity. 
So here in uh, our center, we are using a relatively high uh, humidity in our very small baby, which is less than 30 uh, weeks. We use 80% humidity for the first week of the life. And we wean the humidity by the end of the week because after that, uh, uh, the skin start uh, having some sort of keratinization. So the evaporation is lost. I mean, loses are decreased, uh, evaporative loses are decreased. So we decrease the humidity. Um, but the, most of the uh, literature, if you um, uh, look into the uh, uh, most of the literature, they said 75% to 85% and then go to the 50%. An increase in humidity from 20 to 60 percent decreases about 100 percent trans epidermal water loss, as you can see in this figure. So, if you have a baby of 26 weeks and you have very low humidity, the chances you are having about 80 gram per meter square per hour trans epidermal water loss. If you have a very high humidity, then the chances of this is very low. So according to your gestational age, you put your humidity. So that's why we have um, 50 to 60% in the full-term or the near-term babies as compared to 80% in the first week of the life of the very small babies. Radiant warmer, if you uh, whatever you have uh, in your department, if you have um, open uh, like this uh, resuscitators, uh, then you uh, may have to increase the humidity as compared to the incubators. Not only, uh, I mean, this is just for the uh, illustration purposes, but any incubator uh, you can, uh, is better than uh, the uh, open resuscitator. Water losses via respiratory system, we know uh, increase respiratory rates, increase the water loss, and that's why we have to have uh, CPAP or the high flow nasal cannula, all the humidified air. The photo? Yes. Hello. Yeah, somebody has a question? Uh, I think, sir, someone's mic is on. Okay, okay. Okay. No problem. Now come to the phototherapy. So most of us, we know that the uh, and we start the uh, fluid. But I want to make a point that if you have a halogen light, like a normal tube light or something like that, this is a, a you know, the fluid can be, uh, the baby can lose the fluid about 20%. But if you have a LED light with the light emitting diode, this is will not affect the trans epidermal water loss. We called it cool light. So if you touch it uh, after, let's say, whatever the amount of the hours, it is remain cool. So the chances of having uh, fluid loss in those lights is much lesser as compared to the halogen lights. During uh, my residency, uh, actually, we don't use it. I don't remember we ever used, but there is one thing they call polyurethane or semi permeable uh, dressing or occlusive dressing. It reduces the TEW by more than 50% because at that time they don't have that much uh, hi fi incubators and they use it. And uh, But the question arises that, oh, okay, you are putting something on the immature skin, uh, it increases the bacterial colonization. But there is no increase in bacterial colonization. So it, this is one in 1990, uh, it published uh, and it is the statistically significant. But anyway, we are not using uh, now because we have the incubator. You can uh, think if you don't have the incubators and you cannot provide the humidity. Uh, this is very uh, cheap at that time, uh, this semi-permeable polyurethane thing, uh, but I don't know what is the price now or the availability. So the golden hour and the NRP 8th edition 2020, which is the latest, is said that if you have a baby less than 32 weeks, put it in the plastic bag, not only to control the heat loss, but also the water loss or trans epidermal water loss. There are some special circumstances, which is the uh, AKI, which is the, uh, which we call uh, the uh, acute kidney injury. Um, uh, so you have to uh, tailor your fluids accordingly. 
there are many other um, circumstances like gastroceses, omphalocele. So sometimes you have to give higher fluids because the uh, evaporative losses are much higher because it is open, uh, a big open area um, in the baby, on the baby abdomen. Surgical losses also you have to uh, consider and the skin disorders, of course, the Staphylococcus syndrome or epidermal lysis bullosa. So now come to the uh, main part, the management, how to think, but before going there, these are the body fluid contents, okay? So the stomach, small intestine, bile, ileus, from a diarrheal stool, these are the sodium, potassium, and the chloride approximately into these uh, areas of the body. So main principle, total body water is equal to intracellular plus extracellular. Extracellular water, uh, fluid is divided into intravascular, which is in the vessel like plasma, limb, serum, and the interstitial fluid, which is between the cell, cells. So we have to uh, maintain our appropriate ECF and maintain ECF and ICF osmolality and ionic concentrations. So the principles of therapy, you have to assess, calculate, administer, monitor. This is very important. I will tell you how often you have to monitor, but assess, calculate, administer, monitor. Calculate means the replacement of the deficit, maintenance of the fluid, and replacement of the ongoing losses, if, if is there any. So these are the three, four things you have to understand, assess, and calculate, and what you calculate, deficits, maintenance, and losses, and then you give your fluid. How you assess your uh, fluid, I don't have to go through in details, but the maternal history give you an idea if the mother is on ACE inhibitors, if there's some placental dysfunction, is poorly controlled maternal diabetes, and so on and so forth. The neonatal uh, newborn history is the presence of a poly and or oligohydramnias, severe uh, in utero hypoxemia or the birth asphyxia, which is very common in our country, the environment in which an infant has care, like a high ambient humidity decrease, uh, insensible water loss. If you don't have, then it, it is increased uh, insensible water loss. Weight factor is also very important. How baby is the sick uh, and the sudden change in the infant weight is important, but not necessarily correlated with the change in intravascular volume, as I said here. A skin and mucosa manifestation, cardiovascular sign also. So it is in total management. It, you cannot do that, okay, only concentrate, calculate the fluid and this thing. You have to see how sick is your baby, what is the these uh, cardiovascular sign, what are the respiratory sign, the weight is, baby is gaining weight or baby is losing weight. Of course, you have to do the laboratory evaluation first 20, 12 to 24 hours, may still reflect the maternal values. So don't worry about that, okay? Accurate total urine output and total fluid intake is very important. Blood gas analysis is another important thing because it will uh, uh, give you the, uh, let's say if a metabolic acidosis, is, uh, it indicate uh, tissue, uh, less tissue perfusion. So how you monitor the weight, the term baby uh, approximately losing 1 to 3% per day, 5 to 10% in the first week, preterm losing more 2 to 3% per day, 10 to 15% first week, increased losses, you have to have a fluid correction, decreased losses, you have to have a fluid restriction. And the clinical examination, uh, some signs are, it's not that uh, reliable in that premature age, but 10% uh, uh, dehydration is the sign of dehydration as if it is 15% dehydration in those babies, it is equal to the shock. And of course, you are looking at the serum biochemistry. Urine pa parameters always uh, look because when you do the rounds and many times uh, you ask the nurses or your uh, colleagues that uh, what is the urine output, they said it's uh, acceptable. It, this is not um, acceptable during the round. They have to tell you in mil ml per kg per hour because anything urine output less than one ml per kg per hour uh, is an oligodia. So, sorry about the uh, 
spelling. The specific gravity, you can check by the diffistic or refractometer, but diffistic is very easy. Osmolarity, we discussed, is 100 to 400 milliosmol uh, per liter at freezing point. Blood gas, poor perfusion and shock. Effect of pH on uh, potassium is also very important. Serum creatinine, BUN. So all these parameters, you should have it before you uh, calculate your fluid. So these are the general guidelines. I'm not saying that you adapt the same. Okay, so these are what we are doing, uh, but uh, you can have it uh, your own. Uh, the red uh, in uh, parenthesis is the insensible water loss. So day one, if the baby is less than 1,000, we start about 80 to 150. It depends, but we start about 80. And the 1,000 to 1,500 is 60, and more than uh, 1,500 is 60 to 80. So anyway, this, these are just uh, some uh, calculation based on the insensible water losses and the uh, maintenance of the uh, maintenance fluids of that age of the that weight uh, group baby. So you can develop your own, uh, but this is approximately what we are doing. So come to the fluid recommendation for the first, uh, uh, first uh, uh, you know, for the preterm infant. As I told you before, the transitional phase is first three to five days, okay? So these are the weight losses we discussed. These are the water, ml per kg per day. You should start. These are the sodium. Sodium, chloride, potassium. First 48 hours, we usually don't start. Okay, and then we will go accordingly. Requirement are 10 to 20 percent less with humidified isolate. So, if we put the baby in humidified isolate, if you don't have, and if you you get a baby, let's say uh, 1500, 1600, 1700 gram, you cover with the plastic shield. Okay, it will save a lot of uh, water uh, in the baby. So. You don't have to have a very hi-fi, this thing, this plastic wrap is a very important, uh, you know, uh, thing uh, to protect uh, not only the heat loss, but also the water loss. How you know that the transitional period is finishing? It's very easy. The end of the transitional phase is recognized by decrease in urine output, one ml per kg per hour, a rise in urine specific gravity, and decrease in FEN. So I told you how to calculate all these things. Uh, you can see and then you know, because initially, you, you know, it's a diuretic phase. So as soon as you decrease the urine output is about one ml per kg per hour, it means the transition phase is finishing. Now come to the stabilization phase, which is usually four to five to 14 days. And again, it shouldn't be weight loss. Of course, you should start trophic feed right away or um, feeding in a bigger baby, okay. uh, preferably uh, is breast milk, breast milk and breast milk. But if it is not available, then of course, whatever you have, you can start. The water is about that much sodium, chloride and potassium is around, uh, you know, two to three MEQ. But it's a pretty much a standard, it's nothing new in that. The birth weight should be regained in 10 to 12 days. So our target uh, for a, even for a very low weight baby to reach the full fees around ninth or eighth day of life. Okay, if we have a breast milk, so breast milk we you give uh, very uh, quickly uh, built it up, and uh, Professor Huff already mentioned in his talk that this if you is advanced very fast or advanced less, it will not make such a difference. Now, after the 14 days of life, the weight gain should be 15 to 20 percent. These are the 150 to 180. We hardly go before, beyond 180, but you can go up to 200. You heard Professor Ha uh, to the feeding, but uh, we hardly go 180 because at that uh, um, that uh, total volume, the baby is gaining uh, good weight. Glucose, I will not. Uh, too much uh, um, time on it because the glucose intake uh, is a whole uh, a separate talk and hopefully uh, Saeed and Vikram and uh, Faraz will uh, give another lecture on hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. But 
the usual things which you all know is six to eight milligram per kg per minute of the GI uh, of the GIR glucose uh, infusion rate, and these are the formula: dextrose con concentration times hourly rate divided by the weight times six. There's no cookbook, as I said in the initially. You have to go accordingly. If you have RDS, you have to. Uh, give adequate fluid, but too much fluid can flood it the lung and can increase the chances of the BPD. Too little fluid can give the, the dehydration and hyponatremia. If the baby is uh, having uh, the BPD in the later age of the life, that the calorie, um, you should need a lot of calories, but restrictive fluid, so you need a fortification, uh, whatever you have available. PDA, avoid fluid overload, fluid restriction. If you are still using the endomethacin or ibuprofen, uh, then you should monitor the urine output and at least you should have before starting the course, have one electrolyte and the creatinine level uh, of the baby. We are using acetaminophen. We are using, um, uh, we do the, uh, we are uh, routinely do the LFT one before the start and one after the finishing the course of acetaminophen. Uh, long, long time, we are not using the ibuprofen now. Asphyxia, uh, of course, uh, is a restriction and uh, of the fluid, but right now, I presented in the last year in the conference, uh, no, this year in the conference, that uh, the many uh, centers are not restricted the fluid that much unless and until they find it out the creatinine is, uh, creatinine is the sky high. Otherwise, the 60 ml per kg in the full term baby, even during the cooling, uh, you can continue with that. GI obstruction, of course, we already discussed that if there are significant gastric aspirate, then you have to replace and uh, chest peritoneal drain. You have to do accordingly. So to come back to the renal impairment, the fractional excretion of the sodium, how to calculate urine sodium times serum creatinine, serum divided by serum sodium uh, times urine creatinine uh, times 100 to make a percentage. If more than 2%, it is such as renal failure. If less than 1%, it's a pre-renal failure. Too. It has to be around one. So this is, uh, you know how your kidney function it, it is. It's very easy to calculate um, and you don't need extra tests. We, these are the uh, routine tests you are doing. Some um, old data and which is still valid that if you restrict fluid in the PDA, it is better. If you restrict fluid in the NEC, it is just touching the line of one. Uh, so the, the evidence is not that great, but it's still in favor of uh, restricted fluid. Uh, so these are just to tell you. Now come to the electrolyte abnormality. So if the sodium uh, less than 130 uh, is uh, hyponatremia and hyper is more than 150, but 130, 128, we don't do much. Okay, unless the until is about 126, then we start adding. Potassium less than 3.5, critical is less than 3, and hyper is 6. But it shouldn't be the squeeze sample. If the sample is hemolyzed, then you couldn't get uh, the uh, potassium right. Calcium is also the same. The hypo is less than 7. Uh, and, and ionized is less than 4. And hyper total is more than 11. And ionized is more than 5. So hyponatremia early, if it is in the first week of life, it can be the renal impairment, it can be the excess body water, SIADH, or increased maternal free water intake, anything can uh, do it. You have to balance it, the late hyponatremia, negative uh, sodium balance, the hypotonic IV or increased losses, you have to balance it. Uh, acute uh, symptomatic hyponatremia, as I said, if it is uh, around 125 and less, then you have to treat it. And we use uh, hypertonic saline, 3%, 6 ml per kg, uh, and infuse over one hour and should be given to increase if it is less, about 120 and below then to go up to 125 because you cannot correct the sodium right away to a normal level. So, and just, just to eliminate the seizure. Further correction of hyponatremia should be accomplished slowly and treat the cause, of course, uh, whatever it is. How you calculate the sodium deficit is 0.6 time weight and kg time desired minus actual sodium. And these are the some ranges you can have it. Uh, 
this is the same that uh, ECF excess normal or deficit and these are the causes uh, what you will do if you have excess then restrict fluid if you have normal but if these are the conditions these are the things then you, it's better to restrict the fluid if it's deficit you have to increase the sodium intake hypernatremia um, is a little bit uh, more complicated but i will uh, ask because i will give you the reference uh, uh, there's a one article just published a couple of months uh, in May to, uh, 2022 this year by our own Naveed. It's a very well written article. I recommend all of you, if you want to know all, in and out about hypernatremia, please read that article. So the diagnosis um, of hypernatremia, what we are uh, doing, uh, if it is 150 or above, below 150 we are not doing uh, you know much about that uh, we are not very much about that excess water loss diarrhea uh, insensible water loss or excess sodium intake so this is the uh, article uh, and this is the definition by Naveed. Um, uh, the mild hypernatremia is 146 to 149. We will just observe and watch closely. We will check our uh, fluid that how much we are giving, how much sodium the baby is receiving. If it is moderate hypernatremia, which is 150 to 169, then of course we have to do act on that. And if it is severe, of course, you have to be uh, vigilant about that. The sodium level interp uh, interpretation is also uh, an art. You have to see if the baby is dehydrated, what are the ongoing losses, how much urine output, any medication containing sodium. So all these you have to know. In addition to that, what Naveed mentioned in his article is a very important thing, that the different isotonicity of the fluid and the free water. So for example, the uh, dextrose, why we are not giving a D5? Because it's a 0% isotonic. And normal saline, we called it normal saline because it's isotonic about 96%. So that's why we call it uh, normal saline. We don't uh, call normal saline um, because of the sodium content. Remember, the sodium content of normal saline is higher than your uh, our body. It's about 154 milliequivalent per liter. So these are the different uh, IV fluids and different things. Uh, so you can have it. Um, it's the same uh, from the article which is written by by Naveed. So these are the calculation, how you calculate free water deficit in milliliters. Uh, this is two ways you can uh, calculate it. It's very easy and not, uh, uh, you know, difficult to do that. So hypernatremia management, this is the scheme uh, suggested by Naveed in his article. This is the reference uh, that from 180, 165 to 180, 150 to 164, 146 to 149. At this A, uh, at this time, we will not uh, bothering much actually. And these are the day one, day two, and day three, and how frequent you should check the, uh, you do the blood test. Mm -hmm. I have a little, if Naveed is on call, we will discuss. Uh, I have a little bit uh, too much. This is uh, too frequent, two hours, four hours. Uh, but anyway, it's a point we can discuss. The blood test frequency in this range is about the same. And blood test frequency in this range is every 12 hours. Uh, we are doing every 24 hours if the uh, sodium is in this range. We are not doing 12 hours. But of course, this is, you know, uh, we can discuss, uh, or if if Naveed can give separate uh, talk on hypernatremia uh, uh, in reference to this uh, article. Potassium is very easy to understand. Of course, hypokalemia is critical, and you know the ST dep depression uh, is the main or the U waves. And uh, if you have hyperkalemia, you can have a tall peak T waves. We don't want that. The main thing is to understand the non-oliguric hyperkalemia. Non-oliguric means the baby has a, a sufficient or adequate amount of urine output and they still have the hyperkalemia. So it's a shift of potassium from intracellular to the extracellular fluid space because the decrease is the function of sodium potassium ATPase, which is maintaining the sodium potassium balance in our body. So the hyperkalemia is defined more than five or a serum potassium more than 5.5. 
uh, the serum potassium uh, uh, is about 6, 6.5. It's a very rare to get silent symptoms. So just watch and uh, vigilantly and see. Uh, and if it's an extra potassium going to the baby, you just have to control it. Uh, clinical uh, effects are potentiated by the hypocalcemia. So you have to be maintain your calcium level when you have uh, this uh, and this sample is a free flow sample either from the vein or if you have the umbilical line then it's fine because if you get the you uh, squeeze sample it the chances that the sample is hemolyzed so the cardiac arrhythmias can occur in 60 percent if it is hyperkalemia if it is more than seven so then you have to work on it uh, treatment option uh, this is before 2002 that inhaled uh, albuterol. Uh, they are working on it, but now it's a very much in uh, use. Uh, so this is the uh, scheme for hyperkalemia, stop fluid with potassium, calcium gluconate, sodium bicarb. We are using the glucose insulin combination because insulin is very effective in shift the potassium intracellular. So it is very effective way to control the potassium and of course you have to give the glucose otherwise a uh, baby can have hypoglycemia other thing which we are using is the beta agonist salvetamol salvetamol the side effect of this medicine is the hypokalemia so we can use in the hyperkalemia and the we couldn't find any other side effects uh, when we use because uh, via the nebulization for this purpose and it is also effective Lasix is also, and then if it is not uh, uh, corrected, then that last but not the least is the uh, peritoneal dialysis or exchange transfusion. Calcium is a 10 to 11 milligram per deciliter. Uh, if it is, this is a high, and the you have to uh, stop calcium if it is any, and the hypocalcemia is early onset in the preemies, um, IDM, asphyxias, okay, so 6.5, more than 6.5, then weight supplement if it's less than 6.5, as we discussed early. The common fluid pro problems is oliguria. If it is a urine output, as we discussed, one cc per kg per hour, you have to check is pre-renal, renal, or post-renal by checking the uh, fraction excretion of the sodium also. Uh, and then uh, try to maintain the fluid. Dehydration also by checking the urine specific gravity and others, which we already discussed. And the fluid overload is with is weight gain, often hyponatremia. So we have to restrict the fluid. So these are the general things which we discuss. And let's see if you open your bikes and let's see that. Uh, you can pick up the small, small things, what we just uh, discussed is almost uh, 7.53. Okay, so you are admitting a 32 weeks infant who weighs 1,200 gram. Should you start with what kind of a fluid? So what is your practice, anybody? D5, D7.5 or D10? Uh, you, can, oh, you can open your mic. Participants can raise their hand if they want to answer and we will unmute. Or anybody can answer. Yeah, Saima. What is your practice if a 32 week or 33 week is, uh, is uh, you start with which fluid out of these? Uh, we start with 10% extras. Okay, 10% extras. So, so that's, that's easy and that's uh, always because I just told you about the isotonicity that the d5 and d7.5 is uh, not isotonic and what how how much fluid do you want to give to this baby uh, 80 ml per kg start getting okay yeah so 80 ml is good so this is the easy part now come to the another case uh, or the same case it's a day two and you are writing your tpn if not you are writing your fluid the baby weighs about 1240 gram today sodium is 142 and urine output is adequate okay so the question is do you want to increase decrease or keep fluid same other than saima anybody saeed fraz anybody the baby is day two, you start with 80 ml, the baby weight 
is 1240 gram today. Sodium is 142 and urine output is adequate. So what do you want to do at this point? Uh, hello? Yeah, hello. Yeah. Uh, so we, uh, we will increase the fluid. Uh, you will increase the fluid. 100, okay. 100 uh, ml per kg per day okay. for next day. Okay. For only two years. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Are you going to put sodium in the in the in your fluid or in your TPM? No, sir. Okay. So the question is in this one, as I think, uh, as I told you before, urine output is adequate is not a good way to uh, this thing because you have to know what is ml per kg per hour. Okay. Uh, 142 sodium is uh, okay, uh, so you don't have to add the sodium, and the baby weight is 1240 grams. Most of the time, we don't even increase the fluid, okay? But depends how much is the urine output. Okay, now come to the other case. So you are taking care of 34 week, which is 1.54 kg. And these are all real cases. Uh, they have, so uh, last night when the baby delivered, let's say 10 p.m., 11 p.m., they have a very bad night and nobody know whatever. Then in the morning, you uh, come and you see the baby on D10 running at 5.2 ml hour and it's still NPO. What are the total fluids? So you know how to calculate the fluid? So 5.2 ml per hour, it means time 24 divided by the weight. So it is easy to calculate. It is around 81 or 80 ml per kg per day. Now the urine output, the nurse told you the 34 weaker with a weight of 1.5 from the previous question has 30 ml of urine charted over the past 24 hours. Are you happy with that? Anybody? Uh, as I said, if nobody answering, if I, as I said, I am not. No, sir. Okay. Not at least. Okay. So, how, so always get the ml per kg per hour. So, what is the urine? Uh, Point output? eight one. Point eight yeah. ml. Point eight one. Exactly. So that's the thing. So you shouldn't take this type of statement and it is only 0.8 ml per kg per hour at these uh, when the second day is already started. So it turns out that something happened to the baby and nobody knows in the night because they have the crazy night. Uh, 34 week infant, okay, it received four normal saline boluses of 15 ml, which is 10 ml per kg over the past 24 hours, okay? So now it is about around 10, 11 p.m., which is uh, almost 24 hours. You get the sodium level of 149, so you are trying to figure it out that how much sodium the baby get, okay? So all these happen, okay? And this is happen, if not every day, at least twice a month, these type of things happen. That the post-call people goes without handover, clearly, especially in your peripheral hospital, and you don't know why he received. Now, how much sodium you get the sodium, 149. So this is the formula for that. If it is ml per day of sodium fluid times sodium divided by 1,000 ml uh, divided by the weight, so it's about 6 meq per kg per day. So as I told you, normal saline has 154. If it is on half normal saline, that is 77 meq sodium per liter. So you can, 154 we put because baby was not, uh, uh, get the normal saline boluses. So it's a 6 meq sodium per kg per day he this baby receives. So day three, the baby weighs is 1.57 got 140 ml per kg, somebody increased the fluid to 140, had a urine output of 3.1 ml per kg per hour, has a urine specific gravity of 1.015 and appears a little puffy. So the question is, what do you think? Is the sodium of 149 from inadequate fluid intake or excessive sodium intake? Anybody? Sodium intake, sir. Sodium intake. Why? Why it's not in a fluid? 
So if you guess, sorry, go ahead. Oh, your voice is disrupting, Saima. So you know, the cause. Yeah, so inadequate fluid intake is not the cause. Why? Because at two age, you expect the baby to below the birth weight. This baby gained weight from 1.54 to 1.57. Your urine output is also good and the baby is still appear puffy. The sodium of 149 is probably related to the sodium which he got yesterday. And if you guess excessive sodium intake, yes, you are right because uh, the reason which I we just discussed. So these are the main things you can, you know, pick it up if you are very much, uh, you know, on the, uh, looking at the baby. So one, uh, as in this baby, the night the baby delivered, there are three other baby premature, 24, 25 weeks are delivered. So this baby not have the proper appropriate care as he's supposed to do, okay? And nobody knows why he received uh, the four boluses of uh, sodium uh, normal saline. So because now it's almost eight o'clock, we have to have some time for discussion. So I should conclude that choose an initial rate of fluid and administration based on gestational and the physical environment. What is the physical environment? Do you have a good incubator? Do you have a resuscitator? Mm -hmm. You can cover this thing. And what is the gestational age of baby? The lower the gestational age, the higher the fluid you can um, give. If the humidity you cannot provide. For infant less than 1,000 grams, that generally means the starting with 80 to 100, as we discussed, very low birth weight in infant nurse on radiant environment uh, should be wrapped in the plastic wrap. During the first week of life, 75 to 80% humidity they require. And if the baby is less than uh, 30 or 28 weeks or 1,000 grams, and then reduced to 50%, the sodium potassium should be provided uh, to very low birth weight infant with RDS until after the diuresis has begun. So when the diuresis begin, and as I showed you in the beginning, uh, the chart, uh, the, when it is going into the sodium potassium negative balance, then you should start your sodium potassium. Make sure the rate of glucose administration, we all know, is six to eight or four to six milligram per kg per minute. And you know how to calculate this uh, glucose infusion rate. Begin parental nutrition as soon as possible. Uh, if you don't have the mm, uh, TPN, then uh, you put the, uh, you uh, continue with your fluid, but start with the breast milk available, then start the uh, trophic feeding right away. Even if the baby is sick, you can start some trophic feed with the breast milk. If you don't have the breast milk also, then it's really a little bit problem because the baby can go into the catabolic stage. Calcium, you should be given as a part of initial IV fluid because most of those babies are deficient in the calcium. So if you go through all these stuff again and again, you can be managing and you think, this is all the thinking process. All, you all know the numbers, you know how to calculate, but it's the thinking process. As soon as you see the baby, this baby is 34 week or 35 or the full term, this skin mature, this insensible water loss is, can be that much. So I should give that much amount of the fluid. Nobody in the world can you tell you that the one size fit for all. And the reason the, Oh, most of our babies are doing well in this fluid and electrolyte, although we try our best to, uh, you know, um, mess up with their uh, fluid and electrolyte uh, things, balances. The reason is that the nature is very uh, kind and, you know, the dumbest kidney is, is smarter than the smartest clinician. So that's why most of our baby is doing fine. That's all, and uh, I can open for discussion. If you have any question, please ask uh, Professor. So here is question of Dr. Mia Mohsen. Uh, uh, question kya do we need uh, aid calcium in first day of life? Most of the time, uh, yes, we are uh, using, because we have the TPN, we started the TPN uh, right away, you know. So we add the calcium. Most of the uh, centers, I think Nasser is online also, and uh, Professor Huff, they can share with you. They, uh, uh, they can, uh, you know, uh, they can tell you that uh, most of the, uh, most of us uh, is starting right away, the calcium. 
अच्छा सर एक और क्वेश्चन है कि व्हाई वी डू नॉट गिव केसीएल इन फर्स्ट टू डे ऑफ लाइफ आई एम सॉरी सर क्वेश्चन क्या है पार्टिसिपेंट ने कि व्हाई वी डू नॉट गिव केसीएल इन फर्स्ट टू डेज ऑफ लाइफ केसीएल because most of the time it is transfer from the placenta and is more than enough i showed you that what is the first day the potassium level what is the second day what is the third day so we don't have to uh, give the kcl uh, unless and until it go into the negative balance and you really have a good sample which shows hypokalemia uh, in the sample then you should start so it is no need to start the kcl potassium sodium at the first day of life okay uh, so another question from dr navi durani sir uh, okay, what is uh, your suggestion on existing iv or oral sodium based on urinary sodium and uh, number second is in extreme preterms uh, 500 to 600 grams how to tackle hyper hypercaloric metabolic acidosis as giving acetate as sodium or potassium acetate will give extra sodium to already sodium intake of 1.5 millimole per kg uh, via usc yeah so we uh, so uh, the second question first we are giving the sodium acetate and we are not giving the uh, routine sodium so we are just giving sodium acetate so we calculate how much total sodium including through the uh, you know any lines if they have uh, to open the line what is uh, going on and then we will uh, calculate it and give sodium acetate to uh, have this hypercaloric me metabolic acidosis because uh, this is for increased chloride so we don't give any cl so that's why we use only sodium acetate the first question is that uh, about iv or oral sodium based uh, on urinary sodium this is the thing can you uh, read the question first again okay sir sir uh, question number 1 is okay, what is your suggestion on adjusting iv or oral sodium based on urinary sodium okay this is the difficult question okay but of course uh, if you are measuring the urinary sodium and the fraction excretion of the sodium uh, we always at that point maintaining the iv okay these are these are the problem of the very premature babies mostly the, it is a, a very rare in the full term baby so we have the iv lines we on the baby on the tpn so we are adjusting the iv as compared to the oral uh, so, so sodium based on our urinary sodium so we are adjusting the uh, what you called iv i hope navid you can comment if i answer your question Navid is there? No. Yes. Uh, yes, Doctor Junay. Thank you so much for uh, the comments. Actually, in our unit, we do the urinary sodium and adjust the intake based on it because yeah, we find it more useful and it avoids the pricking the baby again and again for monitoring. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Sir. Second question is: uh, If baby is uh, Doctor Jawad has a question here. If baby is show hyperglycemia. uh can we shift to 5% dextrose so this is another good question you know um i suggest you to uh, put a talk uh, to on a hyper and hypoglycemia yes yes first of all the hyperglycemia is same dangerous to the neurodevelopment outcome as the uh, hypoglycemia which is uh, the uh, most of the time we have misconception hyperglycemia is not we are not trying to do we can tolerate hyperglycemia up to 8 okay not more than 8 on maximum 9 to 10 out of, after that we start the insulin okay and this the, these babies and try not to decrease the gir much or the uh, sodium in the uh, you know uh, in a hypotonic uh, uh, sorry glucose in the hypotonic area so if you have this problem and you don't have the tpn and you don't uh, you have the problem with the the osmolality then it is suggested that just you know you can tolerate up to 9 10 after that you start insulin there's a very beautiful article on hyperglycemia and how it affect the brain development outcome is just published uh, i will find it out maybe 
our boss Nasser uh, is on the line. He, he maybe have it. So this is uh, uh, the way we we try our best not to go in a hypotonic uh, range. But if you don't have uh, resources, if you don't have, then of course you. Um, but try to decrease like seven point five percent, something like that, as compared to go to the five percent. Okay, I hope. Uh, I second question is, sir. Yes, sir. Second question is, Dr. the feed that we give should be subtracted from the total fluids? Yeah. So, of course, you have to decide how much total feed you are giving. So, let's say you are giving um, um, at one point of a time, uh, 10 days of life, 150 ml per kg per day. And uh, that much is the feed and that much is the thing. So, you have to decrease the total feed. So, what we are doing that we will increase the, uh, the feed and decrease the IV fluid as soon as possible. As I said that our target, even in a very, very small baby is to reach the full feed by eighth or ninth day of life. Okay, we rarely go up to 15 days. So eighth or ninth or 10 days, uh, because we are using the breast milk breast, uh, so we increase up to eight, nine. So yes, the total fluid you have to calculate according to the, your baby need, okay? And then you just stick to that. It is not that you are giving too much uh, uh, fluid, uh, you know, then the baby can be uh, getting too much fluid if you are not doing this. So calculate according to the need of the baby and then subtract uh, the uh, feeding from the IV fluid. So another question is, uh, as urine output measurement is important part of the fluid balance, uh, can you please guide how a urine output can be measured with accuracy in premature babies if baby is not catheterized? That's a good uh, thing, but uh, the way everyone is doing, and I think uh, Naveed, uh, Professor Haq and Nasir also can answer this. We are doing the same, uh, like the wet diapers, okay? And we are measuring it uh, accordingly. But if we need a very strict uh, intake output, let's say kidneys are affected and we need a very strict, uh, let's say the baby with the um, hypothermia and we are cooling the baby, we put the catheter in to maintain the fluid so the because the chances of uh, acute kidney injury is very high but routinely we just measuring the you know wet diapers okay uh, so Naveed, now, so now uh, uh, yeah Naveed, so now, what you are uh, doing uh, yes uh, yes uh, the same also we are doing but especially okay. if the baby is on certain medication like paralytic agents, then of course we have to put uh, catheter to measure the urine output. Sure. Okay. Uh, yes, so now I have a query uh, myself. So my question is, uh, okay, why are we not using uh, sodium uh, in first two days of life? I told you in the first two days of life, the sodium is, is in the range. Okay. It will not go down. Okay, so why we, sh we should have to use the sodium? But unless and until, uh, so all these questions which come, so uh, please concentrate on that table which I showed you, the pre-diuretic phase, the diuretic phase, and the post-diuretic phase. So you will get your answer. Unless and until is something sodium, potassium, we need it, we shouldn't give it, okay? So but actually, uh, I have just go through the article, uh, maybe share with around group. Eh? Uh, recently, uh, uh, September of 2022, we published Which so, one? Uh, so J, JP, JPGN uh, article hai. Main abhi share hai, okay. They recommend, they recommend the uh, sodium supplementation because the reason of not giving, which I saw in books, mein se, to wo ye tha ke starting mein jo hai, because of uh, extra cellular uh, fluid loss, ke se wo hypernatremia ke issues were ho rahe the. To unhone ye find, find out kiya. Okay, by giving sodium, hypernatremia issues are not happening. So by giving sodium, you can have electrolytes balance in a normal range. So maybe yeah. share it in the group. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know about that. Uh, Nasser, your picture, I can see your comment needed on that. And then because Nabi, not too much, uh, 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 not too much uh, full strength, but uh, we can uh, give like uh, half a strength or like 0.18. One well, I see 12 to 24 hours, it shows the uh, mother uh, sodium. And then after that, if your sodium is like 140, 142, 
Okay, so why you have to give the sodium? Uh, I am not aware of that article, but so especially uh, in prematures. Yeah, even in the prematures. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, I mean, there's no need to forget what we called uh, here uh, and in states vanilla TPN, which is only contains some. Uh, protein and intralipids. But anyway, this is the, the point of uh, debate. Uh, as I said, uh, if Nabeed is still here or Nasir, you can comment on yeah. that. Yeah, I'll give it to you. My view is that just imagine that wherever the sodium is there, it attracts waters. So the mm -hmm. physiology is that the whether preterm babies or term babies, they have to lose weight. So you have mm -hmm. to adjust the fluid accordingly. So if you are giving sodium on day one of life and the baby has not lost the weight so you have to restrict the sodium intake so that you can uh, do the physiology so right. if you give sodium so it obviously the sodium will retain water and the physiology will be disturbed exactly okay uh, uh sir uh, professor uh, sir you are are you there you you can comment on that yes i'm here i i in my practice, we have not been giving sodium in the first 24 hours. Yeah. And that is a reflection is partly because it's a maternal sodium. The sodium is usually in the normal or slightly high. Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure whether we are not giving sodium because it will retain water because the uh, kidney function is not uh, at that particular moment in time is very dicey, particularly in very preterm infants. So I don't know. But we certainly don't give sodium in, in the first 24 hours. Okay. Nasir, your comment? Bahi, I'm so needed sodium. Or ham jo hai. Kila tiki taste karte hai. Aap log zaroor taste kije ga. It really tastes like vanilla. So, chale, uh, yeah, the, uh, this one, uh, the, he just sent an article. I will go through it and maybe I can answer about that. But we don't usually, and Naveed is beautifully explained that why we shouldn't give the sodium. So, other any other questions, Saeed? Uh, sir, someone more question, Dr. Jawad. We don't have lipid solution available for TPN. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we have to keep the baby NPO for a long time. Right. Can, dextrose, can dextrose solution and amino will suffice? Again, I think this uh, related to Dr. Uh, Professor Khalid Haq. I mean, um, not I cannot say it's a surface, but uh, if you don't have, and why to keep the baby NPU for a long period of a time? So, I don't uh, know. I don't know the answer. Uh, sir, can you comment on this question? I mean, I, I also don't understand the question, uh, question, why should any baby be NPO for a long period of time? And if you, if you do not have lipids, but you're just giving amino, uh, amino acids, you, you're really not giving enough energy. And as I showed you that you, you need uh, energy from not only protein, but you also need energy from uh, lipids. And that uh, seems a bit odd that you and then on top of that if you don't feed the baby that would be crucial very harmful to the baby i think we should exactly. be giving a, starting a non-nutritive feeding very early and then build up the feeding if you don't have a full tpn then try and build up the breast milk feeding as early as possible and as quickly as possible uh, yeah. Jawa saying uh, for sir, example, sir, in, case for of example Nick, in a case of any c if you have to keep the baby npo for a long time and we don't have the lipid solution what should we do well, if in in the case of NEC, it's very difficult. I mean, it's you have in fact in the NEC the energy requirement goes up, so you should be providing uh, more calories. Now, how you provide that? Certainly, uh, nobody would feed the baby uh, with NEC at least for five days. There is a recent uh, a recent evidence that there is no need to wait for t uh, ten days in stage one and stage two, but nevertheless, you have to have the baby nil by mouth for uh, some days. And in those in those days, uh, there, is a, there is a problem if you don't have TPN. Uh, what's the suppose uh, uh, TPN is uh, not available, uh, you know, in, in, in all setups. So, uh, so in that uh, condition, uh, I think yeah. we can use uh, dextrose solution or amino bill. 
you can use a manual digestive solution, but as uh, sir said, that you have to start feeding as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Right, yeah. Sir. So and build up the feed. Uh, we get the good talk, excellent talk on that. That uh, there is no difference if you start if you increase fast. If you have a breast milk, then it, you will solve all these problems. Uh, if I if I may, Junaid, uh, just comment on that. The sure. the, the um, protein solution, the aminosol, which they are using in uh, in Pakistan and the units I have seen, it is mm. based it is the adult solution, and that has got a very high feed and alanine level. And if you're giving um, uh, just uh, the that particular aminosol, you really are taking a great chance with phenylalanine level, and the and the tryptophan level is also very high. So there are problems with that amino salt solution which is being used in Pakistan. And people don't uh, particularly pay attention to that because the, uh, the neonatal uh, uh, amino acid solutions are not available in Pakistan currently. Yeah, okay. This may be going into finer details, but there is a problem when we pe people say we are using TPN, they have to be very careful in saying what amino, amino acid solution they are using. Sure, sure. Sure. I think we will discuss these uh, issues in the uh, TPN talk or the parental. I know there are a lot of centers that don't have it, but, you know, it's still for the, uh, you know, just for the, the knowledge we have it. Yes, sir. Another question from uh, Sajid, uh, Dr. Sajid. What specific wet machine uh, you use for measuring urine output as amount of urine is sometimes uh, very tiny to measure accurately? Well, I, this is the most difficult question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Junaid is very easy. To, they can go and buy it at any, any yeah. micro scale. The scale exactly. is available. So yeah. we have these micro scales. They just put the diaper before uh -huh. they uh, put it to, on the baby and after they remove it. And that's it. <laughs> As I uh, said. Dr. Dr. Junaid, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 I hear Sajid. Yeah, the reason I put this question is for the junior. So I did the very same. I went to the blood bank and blood banks, they have got these micro scales in yeah. which you can get in, you know, grams. So the pamper weighs 20 to 25 grams. You can deduct that. So that's mm -hmm. why I asked this question. Another thing to add is regarding uh -huh. this uh, amino well. Yeah. Uh, what my concern is that because it's an adult preparation, and as uh, 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 Professor Hakka said about this uh, tryptamine and other stuff as well, but the other yeah. big problem is the osmolality. It is an adult solution. It has got yeah. a very high osmolality, and in tiny babies, we know that we, we do not have any option in neck. But exactly. the problem is if you get this amount of will, we do not have a research. Kidneys are not working efficiently, and we're giving a solution which is made for adults with a different osmolality. I think it's quite risky. What do you think on that? Yeah, I agreed. No, I, I fully agree with you. I mean, I have been raising this question with many, many people in Pakistan uh, about the uh, use of the adult solution and uh, uh, encouraging people to ask the drug companies to provide the proper neonatal uh, amino acid solution. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we, and have the able to, we have just been able to decide what the cost of paracetamol will be for next year. So, in the next 100 years, we'll be able to decide about the minor solution also. I didn't get it what uh, Jawad is saying, but anyway. Uh, I was uh, just yeah. being sarcastic that we have just decided on national level that what will be the, yeah. what will be the cost of paracetamol tablets. So, in the uh -huh. next 100 years, we'll be able to decide about the minor solution also. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but, with, with due respects, I think, Jawad, uh, if we are going to provide neonatal care, uh, when we are providing ventilation, when we are provide, uh, providing therapeutic hypothermia, then we, we need to be cognizant of the fact that you can provide one thing which is so expensive. Mm -hmm. What is the point? If you're, if you're not going to save the baby with all the other complications which you have. I mean, nobody argues in Pakistan about putting the baby on a ventilator. Yeah. And they put babies on a ventilator when they don't have blood gas machines. So if, yeah. if we are talking in those senses, then that's a very different ball game altogether. Mm -hmm. 
that's uh, uh, the whole thing. Dr. Junaid, Dr. Junaid yes, one more thing. Yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, for a reasonable period of time, the B Brown, the company B Brown was providing the aminoplasmin and lipofundin. So yeah. aminoplasmin and got this amino acids and lipofundin. That was good. But the mm -hmm. problem is due to the corona, there is an acute shortage of that uh, supply. Ah, so okay. that's one thing which could be tested and involve the, all, all the seniors with the expertise in the neonatal nutrition and all these uh, mm -hmm. electrolytes. I think that was a very good thing, which we did use. When I came from UK, I did use aminoplasmin and lipofundin. But the problem is how much mm -hmm. to give and what is the percentage? Because we do not have in-hospital TPN specialists in most of the hospitals in Pakistan, yeah. except few like Indus and Shiva and AKU. So the problem is who to guide at these uh, district level hospitals. That's the problem. So, so but so if why that B brown is available, I think there's a hope. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Sajid. But why we uh, cannot get help from AKU or Indus Hospital uh, to, you know, uh, to measure for you or to make a protocol, local Actually, protocol. Did, like because because I am in I am I am in, uh, living close to Twin Cities in Wakant mm -hmm. and the Shifa International. They have mm -hmm. started TPN uh, for quite some time. There was some uh, I heard that there was some issues with the I think this contamination. I'm not sure about that, but the problem was the cost. So uh, because you have, to, you have to do the electrolytes and other things which we did you uh, do in the UK, but that's very costly to do these bloods then. You, uh, they have given an email address, you can send that. But I think that service was stopped uh, a, a few months ago. Uh, but there was an option, but the cost was huge. So in our hospitals where we are already struggling with uh, so many things, so TPN is a very, very costly uh, you know, uh, stuff. That's a very big limitation. And what I think is that the any solution is not a solution if that is not affordable. We lost you, Sajad. Sajid, we lost uh, you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. So what I mean to say is that any solution, you know, the solution is not a solution if it is not affordable, because then the major chunk of the nation, they struggle if the TPN is very costly. So Shifa International did, uh, you know, a very good job. But what the problem is the cost of this TPN sure. and the 24 hour time, you know, it just expires. I think I agree with all of you. Dr. Yes, Sajid, I fully agree with you, but that's the microeconomics of doing neonatology at all, yeah. or doing yeah. neonatal intensive care in a, in, in a resource-limited country. Yeah, yeah. yes. And, you know, the, the, as, I, as we always said, when uh, myself and uh, Professor have in Pakistan and many uh, other meetings, that we are spending a lot of money in different things, okay? So we have to focus on uh, things, what we needed and what are the basic of uh, basic need for that. As I showed in the first slide, that what is the neonatal care about it and what we needed for that. So... Uh, we have to prioritize our um, 